pretty doggone lucrative stuff. A lot of people drive them. This is the oil system. This is part two of the Power Stroke Diesel 7.3. This, this generation of diesel actually went from 1994 until 2003. Now, 2003, there was an overlap. The six liter came out in 2003. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, so pay attention to the uh, question. At the end, we'll have the question, so you need to watch this really carefully so you'll be able to answer the question. Well, the lube oil for a low pressure system is directly tied to the high pressure system because the low pressure system feeds the high pressure system and the, low, the lube oil system fills up a reservoir right up on the top of the engine there and bolted into that reservoir is the high pressure oil pump that actually sends high pressure oil to the injectors and the high pressure oil that goes to the injectors is used to drive the, the you know, that intensifier piston down that gives your injector its uh, fuel delivery capacity. Uh, some of the concerns involved in the low pressure oil system may affect performance and drivability. This is what it looks like uh, if you look at the way this oil system is laid out. Uh, basically you got an oil cooler here and you got a pressure regulator relief valve and an oil filter bypass valve in there and there's your little, there's a little short circuit device <coughs> right here. That little short circuit device, if it's not working right, it can cause funky little problems. Because basically what, you're, what it's supposed to do, the short circuit device, is supposed to fill up that reservoir whenever the engines first start spinning over so that this reservoir right here will have all the oil that it needs. And it's sort of like bypass. If that the little plunger gets stuck in there, you may find yourself starting this up, and as soon as that high pressure oil pump uses up all the oil in there, it'll stall if you drive about 100 yards or something like that. And you have to spin it and start back up. The oil comes in here, there's the oil pump, goes out through the oil cooler, goes in here, it feeds the crank. Now, you know what these old J-shaped things are? What are they? By the way, that's the valve train right there. Those actually feed oil to spray the underside of the pistons to keep them cool. Those are oil cooling jets. Some of your high performance gasoline engines don't even have those. All right, so uh, basically the low pressure oil system serves as an additional function and it feeds the high pressure reservoir. We talked about that before. You'll see this on these, on those quick power stroke diesels there. And that little cap you can take off, if you're wanting to know if there's oil in that reservoir, you can take a little cap off and look down in there. It holds about a quart of that. All right, so I always like to suck that oil out of there whenever I'm doing an oil change, you know, and fill it with new oil, but the, the system will do it when you do it. Uh, one loop oil flow path sends oil to the high pressure reservoir initial fill gallery, and that's an integral cylinder block. To work on this little thing, you basically got to pull the timing cover off. It's, you know, a little aggravating to do. Facilitates oil flow to the reservoir very quickly on initial or cold start, so it fills that reservoir up really fast. All right, so you got your gyrodotor oil pump here. You know what that's like? Is it turns around? It basically creates a suction on one side, and then it forces the oil out on the other side. And that's what it looks like in the real world, but that's actually a picture on a six liter. But it's the same kind of pump. The engine oil pumps gyrodotor type driven off the flats of the crankshaft. A lot of your oil pumps are driven off of the distributor shaft. And some of them are well on that Toyota, uh, little Toyota out there is driven off the timing belt. So, you know, the, if anything, it keeps the oil pump spinning and it's a positive displacement, you know, any oil that comes out of there. Does the oil pump produce, produce pressure or just volume? We talked about just volume. What is, what, what is it that enables it to produce, to, in other words, how, how is the pressure created in a, lubrication system on a vehicle. If you if all the oil pumps do it and it is positive displacement, it's just got volume, it can't produce pressure. No, the it's got a pressure relief valve, spring loaded. And that pressure relief valve, as the oil pressure pushes that pressure relief valve against its spring, that spring, uh, that piston moves to a certain place where it opens up and lets it bypass, but that pressure relief valve is going to directly affect your oil pressure. Now remember I told you one about our I rebuilt this international uh, truck engine one time that was a gas burner and every all the clearances were just like they were supposed to be and the guy had already spent all he wanted to spend and we didn't tell him he need, wanted to tell him he needed a new part. The oil pump wasn't wore out but the spring in the relief valve in the oil pump, you take a little pin out and pull this little plunger and spring out, was basically the relief valve spring was a little bit weak and so I took it and uh, put a bunch of washers behind it to tighten it up and the oil pressure came up like it was supposed to be. So, you know, basically you got to have a relief valve and with a spring behind it that that's however much pressure it takes to push that spring to where it's going to open and go. That's what gives you. So if your oil pressure relief valve sticks in the open position, you won't have any oil pressure even if everything else is right. 
and that does happen. It's important to know that when installing the gear assembly, the gears are marked for placement. Uh, the energy rotor must be installed with the words out or damper facing away from the engine. So that's a little bit of a thing. And you got this oil pressure regulator here. You see, that's your oil filter head and all that. Uh, it's got located in the filter housing. The regulator valve starts to open to the sump above 50 psi. That protects the engine components from damage caused by high engine oil pressure. See, if, that, if the engine oil pressure goes too high, you can have issues, you know, you can bust a cooler. I've actually <laughs> known of, uh, back in the old days when Chevrolet's used to have a, a big old thick uh, a canister top oil filter underneath the bottom where the spin on oil filter is now, they had a bolt going through it. Uh, you really, there wasn't a whole lot that the high oil pressure could do. But if the relief valve sticks and won't move in the oil pump so that the pressure just keeps going up, it can blow the oil filter slam off the car. Because that thing, that oil pressure is going to go somewhere. Uh, either that will choke the engine down if it's one of those with that thick oil filter cup I was talking about. All right, so you got an oil filter bypass valve. When you're screwing the filter on, you can look up there and see that. All right, prevent damage caused by lack of lubrication. If the filter is plugged, the bypass valve is provided, and if the filter becomes restricted, it locates the filter out All right, now when we do our diagnosis, this thing here particularly causes a problem. A missing bypass valve can allow the oil gallery to drain, and that can produce stalling problems after start up on the power stroke. So if it starts up just fine, but then it stalls because you know this thing right here has it. That's basically supposed to keep the gallery full, sort of like you know your fuel pressure is on the, on the fuel system. You don't want the fuel pressure to go away and not be there. And there's your oil cooler up there, and you know this actually is your pickup tube goes to the oil pump, comes out to the cooler. And then fill, it goes through that little short circuit device and goes up and fills up that reservoir. All right. So the oil cooler is a cylinder with a set of tubes that carry the engine oil submerged in engine coolant. So you got coolant. You can have a mix of engine coolant and engine oil here if you've got a bad oil cooler. So that's something to keep uh, keep in mind that the the, the uh, engine oil temperature is transferring heat to the coolant. So if, if those things get together, you got issues there. The buckets that those injectors go down through into the head, like I showed you yesterday, they can actually, there can be a cool leak thing there too. Uh, helps bring the oil up to operating temperature sooner and keeps it cool and at a constant temperature, which is pretty important. Now this right here is a high pressure oil system. This other system we've been talking about feeds that in here. And so basically you're going out to these fuel rails. These fuel rails on this one are built into the heads. On the six liter, the fuel rail is, I mean the oil rail, not fuel rail. The oil rail is removable. The high pressure oil rail, the purple is high pressure oil. Now it's removable on the uh, six liters, but it's not removable on the uh, seven three. It's all a part of the head. You know, and if you ever get ready to pull an injector out, there's a couple of little screws, a little plugs up in here. You're supposed to take one of those out and let all of that oil leave out of there. Because if you pull an injector out with this right, with all that oil, you know, up here in these reservoirs. All that oil will, and, the, and also the fuel will go blah, 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 blah. You're supposed to drain the fuel rail and the oil rail before you pull an injector out. And so you just pull in an injector out, there's more to it than just janking it out of there like it is on the gas burner. That's down there under the valve cover. That's those 115 volt injectors we were talking about yesterday. All right, so the short circuit gallery, and I can't talk enough about that because you can't have issues on that one. Once it starts or during warming, you start the check valve closes and the high pressure oil pump receives filtered oil from the high pressure oil pump reservoir. Now this right here is actually supposed to send all up here and fill that up right away as quick as it can. If people have trouble with those, that is a sort of an annoying thing, like I say, to go get. And a lot of people try to dodge that, but whenever that thing's stuck and it's not working around, there's nothing else you can do. Uh, it's connected directly to the pump discharge. That provides a quick fill of the high pressure reservoir for fast cold starting. We talked about that. All right, the injector pressure regulator drain back used to be a problem there. And they had a little check valve right here that would get fouled up. And so you'd wind up with uh, the oil, you know, siphoning out of there, and it would empty the reservoir going this way. So they went to 96 and later, they did this a different way. They were doing the, the job so that it went over the top and down, so there was no way it could siphon out of there, you see. So the, this is your uh, ICP uh, injector pressure regulator right here. The injector pressure regulator is an electric solenoid, and the computer actually operates it to regulate the high control oil pressure because the high control oil pressure is out and determines how much fuel it's going to shoot in there and how forceful it's going to be. You've also got pulse width issues. It's figured in uh, cubic millimeters and you know, this kind of thing. Volume of fuel desired, mass fuel desired, and that kind of stuff. All right, now the high pressure oil pump is a gear driven seven plunger swash plate pump. It's all delivered by the high pressure pump to rails machine in the cylinder head. And this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. It's got little plungers in there 
and it spins around. And that's basically what you're looking at there. That little thing uh, puts out 3,700 pounds of pressure. This is the injector control pressure regulator right here. Now that's a pressure relief valve, and the pressure, it relieves the pressure if it gives up 3,700 pounds. You remember, that's pressure relief right there for, the high, for, the, for this big old strong pump right here. This goes where the injector pump went on the older 7.3s that didn't have the uh, electronic diesel fuel injection. That one right there, every now and then, I used to have to change these. This can cause a no start. And one of the things that I noticed, if you ever uh, unplug that, uh, this thing defaults to low pressure. Now the interesting thing is on the uh, common rail system that has high fuel pressure on your Duramax, if you unplug the sensor, that's the counterpart of that on the high pressure common rail, the, the Duramax defaults to high pressure, this defaults to low pressure. And so this right here never gets over 65% duty cycle. So uh, if, if you short it, you know, it'll make it, when we were at school up there, when I first went to school on this thing, we had the breakout box on one, and this guy gave me a set of instructions that I interpreted to say to short the signal, I mean to short this, the trigger to ground for this, and I shorted it to the ground, that went to 100% and the engine was sitting there rocking and snorting and all that kind of stuff and the instructor was jumping up and down screaming, stop, stop, stop. He was afraid I was going to tear the truck up. Of course, it's tougher than that. The injector control pressure regulator is an electronically controlled valve. Controls the drain path out of the pump and it's controlled by the PCM to regulate injection control pressure. That's what it looks like. He doesn't have a solenoid on it there because you just slide that on there. And this little part right here, you see that little uh, sharp edge? They call that the edge filter because stuff can't get past that if it's solid material. The only thing you can get past that is oil. And so it's just regulating injection control pressure using this thing that's got an internal uh, solenoid on it. That's what it looks like on the truck. The solenoid slides on that thing and then you got a little pal nut that holds it. And when you plug that in, you can actually hook an oscilloscope up to that and see what, the, uh, see what it's doing there. Uh, and it creates a magnetic field that applies a variable force on the regulator. And it, it basically can do that. You're going to get codes like a P1211 code, I think, and it would say it's calling for a particular pressure and it can't meet that target and that kind of thing. Okay, with the engine off, the valve spool is pushed on by the return spring and the drain ports are open. So it doesn't go, there's no oil pressure going to the high pressure oil rails whenever the engine's off. All right, so during cranking, an engine with an oil temperature more than 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the oil pressure will normally be approximately 1,500 PSI during cranking. You might remember the one I told you about that had been accustomed to cranking with low fuel pressure, which is fuel pressure is supposed to be 55 to 80, and it was like 20 pounds, and they said it starts hard. After they put the fuel pump in there, it had, the adaptive learning had driven the starting pressure up to like 3,000, 3,500 pounds, and it was putting too much fuel in there, it was making white smoke, and the truck wouldn't start, and all that stuff. Uh, eventually, under cold operating conditions, the pressure may be as high as 2,700 PSI. And that is basically the oil pressure, not fuel pressure, because it's driving that piston, right? Once the engine starts, it sends a signal to the IPR to give the gallery pressure desired. The injection control pressure sensor monitors actual gallery pressure. The injection control pressure sensor is in one of the oil rails. Now, whenever I was doing work on these and I had drained all those rails and I pulled all the injectors out and I was putting them, and I put all the injectors back in with their new O-rings and all that and got them all cinched in there like they should, what I would do and before I started it up and I put the valve covers back on was I would take a plug out of the other rail that was a in the front of the head, and I would take the uh, injector control pressure regulator out so I could look down in there, I'd spin it over until those oil rails filled up. When the oil rails filled up, then I'd put those plugs back in there, plug the IPR in, and it would fire up. All right. The PCM compares actual gallery pressure. There's a little sensor right there I'm talking about. It's looking at that. Uh, it compares actual gallery pressure to desired pressure and adjusts the signals using the IPR, which is right over here. See? So these two work really closely together. PCM reading this, it's a three wire sensor. It's got the five volts reference voltage and the uh, signal return and all that. So, anyway, so the injector control pressure sensor uh, provides the signals to the PCM indicating oil rail pressure. If that pressure is not at least 500 psi, it won't even operate the injector. Uh, so, and that's another thing that if you disconnect the IPR, it will default to 750 pounds and it will start if it can. So that's a little troubleshooting procedure you can do. Um, the VCM compares the actual rail pressure to the desired rail pressure and adjusts it, so on and so forth. 
And see, like, here's, this is really hard. I should have done that better. ICP 543 PSI, IPR 11%. The injector pressure regulators with a little solenoid on the pump. The injector pr control pressure sensor is the one that it shows you that's on the rail itself. And so it needs to know what's there. There's your oil rail there, that sensor up there. And this pipe right here is a real heavy duty braided line. Real, you can't just put any kind of a hose on there with a couple of clamps because it'll blow it off of there. And if you ever happen to crack open any of these really high pressure systems whenever your face is in the way, I know some of you guys hate wearing safety glasses. Well, they'll be putting you in a nursing home and you'll have to have pennies, you know, you fill your cup and all that kind of stuff. All right, here's your injectors right here. That's what they look like if you got one laying there. That's what I had laid on my bench there. During cranking, a minimum of 500 PSI of oil pressure is required for the injectors to operate. Okay, some concerns involving a low pressure oil system may affect vehicle performance and drivability. True or false? We got time. We can go through another lesson today. Yay! All right. What component in the low pressure oil system prevents damage caused by a plugged oil filter? Do you remember? Do you remember? Bot guys. Write it down. Of course, I will grade these and they will become a part of your permanent transcript and they can ruin your grade point average if you bomb on this test. What's the minimum oil pressure required for the injection to operate? 500 PSI. That's right. That's the high pressure oil now. Not, that's not lube oil pressure. That's the high pressure. All right. What are the functions of the oil cooler? What else did it do? Warms oil up quicker too. Keeps it. It warms it up quicker. Keeps it cool. Keeps it at an even temperature. Right? A high pressure oil system is also known as. You have to wing it on that one. I will only give. I've already given you the one answer that I'm going to give you. Yeah. Yes. What is the function of the ICP sensor? What is the function of the injector control pressure <laughs> sensor? tests at the end of this one too. You're just basically going to wrap those in there, you know, put a fresh set of numbers on there and write the answer when you get to it. The temperature at which fuel begins to burn is referred to as the ignition point. Diesel fuel, which has a low ignition point, is said to have good ignition quality. Fuel that have a good ignition quality will burn soon after being injected into the combustion chamber. The cetane rating is something you probably never have heard of. It's kind of like octane, but it's a diesel thing. All right, the measure of the is the quality of diesel fuel. Now, for rating purposes, diesel fuel is compared with cetane, which is a colorless liquid hydrocarbon that has excellent ignition qualities and is rated at 100. All right, the higher the cetane number of diesel fuel, the shorter the lag time from when the fuel first enters the combustion chamber until it lights off. All right, so premium gasoline burns slower than regular gasoline and has more resistance to pre-ignition and detonation. But the higher an octane number, the more resistance the fuel will have to knocking. Diesel fuel cetane ratings are the opposite of gasoline octane rating. The faster burning diesel fuel is considered to be a better quality fuel. For gasoline to be considered premium, it must burn slower, so it's the total opposite thing there. The high quality diesel fuel with a high cetane rating will ignite the moment it enters the combustion chamber. If there's a delay in the ignition of the fuel, performance of the engine will suffer. And specific gravity of a fuel is the measurement of the vehicle's fuel weight as compared to water. Remember that specific gravity of anything has got to do with how the weight of that, whatever it is, compares to water. If you add stuff to water, it's going to change specific gravity of the water, too. The importance of specific gravity of diesel fuel is it going to be heavy enough to achieve adequate spray penetration into the combustion chamber. If the specific gravity is too low, all the fuel will burn immediately on entering the combustion chamber, and that's not good. The heat value of any fuel is measured in British thermal units, which is BTUs, right? 
the more heat produced by a fuel, the more energy available can be changed into usable power. A British thermal unit is the amount of heat take that you need to use to raise one pound of fuel one degree Fahrenheit. So that's about like a burning match, basically, what we got there. The diesel fuel to gasoline comparison, the average weight, average BTU, diesel 7.1 pounds, diesel a little heavier than gas. 138,000 BTUs, gasoline <coughs> 6 pounds per gallon, 124,000 BTUs. Remember those numbers, they'll be on the top test, okay? Maybe not the test you're getting today, but maybe the test that gives a look tomorrow, or next day, or Monday, or maybe we're not going to be here, whatever. I'll, I'll hit you with that sooner or later. Vol volatility is the ability of a liquid to change into a vapor. The gasoline is really volatile compared to diesel fuel. If both diesel and gas were dip dripped to a heated steel plate, the gas will evaporate without igniting, but the diesel fuel will not immediately evaporate, but will burn with a flame when it reaches a certain temperature. It's the flash point, it just burns off. You see, it's just a total flame. Lubricity refers to the capacity of the fuel to reduce friction. So how lubricity is important for diesel fuels other than the tight tolerances in the injectors and the injection system. You don't want metal to metal, you want it to be a little layer of oil in between there, and the, the diesel fuel does that. Viscosity is the property of a fluid that resists the force which causes fluid to flow. The fluid viscosity can be affected by the temperature, and the warmer the fluid, the less resistance there will be to flow. So viscosity can directly affect the spray pattern of the fuel in the combustion chamber. Fuel with high viscosity results in a fuel dispersion that contains large droplets that are hard to burn. We don't want large droplets either in gasoline or diesel fuel. One of the reasons that gasoline direct injection produces so much benefit is that the droplets that a gasoline direct injection injector produces are so tiny that they, you have total perfect combustion and really good flame propagation too. Um, and this is what the cloud four points is. And this is whenever you screw the top off of that filter, this is what you're looking at right there. You pull the filter out of there and you see whatever fuel there. If I pulled one of these off and I saw that red diesel fuel in there, like I said yesterday, I'd send them on their way and tell them that they're going to have to put some regular diesel fuel through it so I can do anything else with it. Diesel fuel is affected by temperature much more than gasoline because diesel fuels contain paraffin, a wax substance. Now that's slightly changing with the newer diesel. They're not quite like that. You know, there's not as, the diesel fuel formulation has changed for emission purposes. So some of this stuff right here, you know, dates back a little bit. As temperatures drop past a certain point, wax crystals start to form in the fuel. Not all fuels have the same cloud point. Winter blended diesel fuel is able to withstand a much lower temperature. As temperatures drop further, the fuel will start to clot because the wax crystals get bigger. And you got, if it gets colder, it'll reach a point where it won't pour. That's the pour point. And that's why a lot of these diesel trucks, whenever I, back in 1985, it dropped down to one below zero here, and I was working at a truck shop then, and I had to go all over Enterprise getting trucks started. It wouldn't start because the diesel fuel turned to jelly. All right. So a high pour point, uh, you know, you got to follow the gel point, is just past the four point. That's when the fuel becomes jelly and it occurs at a real cold temperature. Sulfur content increases bringing cylinder wear. Why? Because sulfur turns into sulfuric acid as it mixes with the water that's created during combustion. And I read somewhere a long time ago that 95% of engine wear is due to sulfuric acid content in the motor oil. That's why it's so important to keep your PCB system working good. And we've got varnish on piston skirts is the primary cause of sludge in the oil pan, plug converters. Marked fuel is industrial fuel. That's the red stuff, red or blue. Usually red is what we see around here. It has a tendency to be stored for longer periods, and it may also contain more sulfur than commercial fuels. And there's two grades of diesel, D1 and D2. Uh, the fuel typically recommended for automotive diesel D2, formulated with sufficient viscosity and energy content to make it applicable to most diesel engines. D1 is used in winter when all the more viscosity is needed. So water and diesel fuel can cause icing at low temperatures can carry rust and other contaminants, can cause severe corrosion, oxidation, rust problems in injectors and pumps. Gasoline mixed with diesel fuel ignites faster and has lower lubricity than diesel fuel. Engine and fuel system damage are probable if gasoline contaminated fuel is used. And I've seen people, like on uh, church buses and stuff, sometimes somebody would put gas in a diesel and on these power strokes it comes in, it is, you know, it's barely will run, feel like I put a potato in the exhaust pipe or something. Uh, what's the measurement of the ignition quality of the fuel? Hurry up! Come on! Alright. What is the measurement of the fuel's weight as compared to water? That, that may be BCU. 
Come on. The British. Okay, I got to give you one answer. This is what I'm going to give you. What is it? Specific gravity, okay? Specific gravity. Think about gravity, weight, gravity, weight. You know, you see, in that particular case, as I said that while ago so plainly, before y'all zoned out or something, you know, this is smart and this is where y'all were, okay? <laughs> All right. Water entering the precise fuel system components can cause extreme damage because? Rust. So very fast. <laughs> Gasoline and a diesel engine may cause free ignition. Wow. What else? What else could it cause? You count on the diesel fuel for what? The gasoline doesn't have? The diesel fuel is heavier. Lubricity. Gasoline engine takes the lubricity away and it wears out components. It ruins them. All right. Next time we meet on this, uh, probably be like Wednesday or Thursday, we'll do the oil quality lesson. All that. We have a little ways to go on this, but you guys are going to understand a lot more when you're through than you did when you started.